Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. It's uh, 1 p.m. UTC. Uh, perhaps let's begin. Uh, some participants might continue to trickle in, but thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Uh, bienvenidos, bonjour. Uh, we really welcome you to this important conversation today on COVID-19, gender-based violence and masculinities. Uh, we're really appreciative of you joining us uh, to share some space for this important conversation. We're going to unmute everybody now and can I just invite everyone to say a hello and a greeting in your own language that you're most comfortable with. We'll do it all at the same time. Uh, so we're gonna unmute now and just take a moment to say hello, Namaste. Hello. 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 Jennifer, sorry, you're mute, so Jennifer, we can hear you. Jennifer, nous pouvons vous entendre maintenant. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Muchas gracias. Uh, I was saying thank you so much. Amazing. Merci uh, what an amazing uh, diverse group of colleagues we have. Thank you so much for that. I always uh, love to hear uh, when we all share our hellos. Wonderful, so let's continue. Um, as we're about to get started, we just thought actually we'd take a few minutes uh, to do a, a poll question. This will just take a few minutes. It's going to pop up right now on our screen. And this was just to uh, further know, uh, explore who we have on the call, what you work on uh, in order to set up a bit the conversation for our speakers and what we'll get into. So um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind answer, we have what is the main focus of your work? Working uh, with men and boys on gender equality, working on gender equality, but not specifically with men and boys working with men and boys, but not specifically on gender equality, working in another sector, other. Thank you so much. We have about half have participated now. This will be uh, quite relevant as we continue on the conversation. Also for all colleagues who ask for resources as follow-up, uh, here we can get a good idea of all of you who are joining and what specifically has perhaps brought you to this conversation, no? Direct work or interest in the work. Okay, so as uh, the rest of the responses are trickling in, uh, pretty much uh, half and half of the bulk of participants we see are uh, both colleagues working with men and boys directly on gender equality and those working on gender equality, uh, but not specifically with men and boys, uh, perhaps seeking to gain some more information um, and uh, participate in a further analysis of, of the work to engage men and boys in gender equality. Thank you so much. Uh, we also have about 4% working with men and boys, but not specifically on gender equality. Uh, we have about 13% working in another sector. Uh, so thank you for joining uh, this conversation to learn more. And then we have other, uh, so colleagues working in, uh, I'm sure a variety of other important topics. Wonderful, so that's, uh, that's really interesting to, to note and highlight. We appreciate your participation in that. Uh, great that we can understand a bit the cross section of who's, who's joining. And again, well, welcome and thank you so much for participating, no? Great, thank you, Tom. Uh, Tom is our technical guru, so I'll ask us to stop sharing this now so we can continue. 
Wonderful. So uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes really to just quickly introduce uh, who we are. Um, and Men Engage Alliance uh, works to transform unequal power relations and patriarchal systems uh, by, of course, addressing masculinities, building inclusive alliances from local to regional to global levels. Uh, working with men and boys through an intersectional feminist approach and uh, of course fostering joint actions in partnership with women's rights, gender and other social justice movements. If we could go to the next slide. Yeah, while we wait for the next slide, um, Men Engage Alliance is, uh, thank you so much. We're inclusive of over 700 CSO members uh, currently in about 74 countries, organized into 42 country networks uh, and six uh, regional networks. Uh, and it's important to note, of course, this uh, constituency of members uh, are not just organizations working uh, exclusively to engage men and boys, but of course self-reported feminist organizations, SRHR organizations, LGBTQ organizations. Uh, so it's quite a diverse uh, constituency of those that have come together uh, under the shared interest of engaging men and boys and transforming um, gender justice and masculinities, transforming masculinities towards uh, gender justice, no? Thank you, and next slide. And we just wanted to give a very uh, warm thank you, welcome to our core organizers for this online uh, workshop series. Of course, we have Sanke Gender Justice, uh, Madre uh, Fighting for uh, Feminist Futures, and uh, Pardon my, my butchering, uh, my son de la culture de diversities humanas. Carlos, if you wouldn't mind coming in to, to more eloquently. Oui, maison de la culture de diversités humaines. Thank you. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, and it's been a wonderful collaboration and fantastic to have you here for this rich discussion. Uh, and lastly, before we enter the conversation, uh, we just thought to ask uh, one more uh, poll question in order to set up um, a bit uh, the dialogue that we are about to embark on. Uh, the question is, what harmful behaviors associated with masculinity are you seeing because of COVID-19? And uh, Tom, if you would not mind initiating the poll, we'll take a few minutes and uh, think through this from, of course, the individual level, uh, all the way through the structural level, uh, also including our, our leaders, no? Uh, most of whom remain men, uh, but also more generally, right? What harmful behaviors associated with masculinity are you seeing because of COVID-19? And Tom Pardon, I'm not seeing the poll pop up. I don't know if we're having a challenge with that. Sure, so, so I'll just uh, come in for a sec, Jenny. Yeah, if this, this question is just going to be for in the chat box, because um, the poll feature is a little bit um, too simple. <laughs> and uh, we want to invite you to just share any thoughts or ideas on things you might have seen in your context. Have you seen it from political leaders? I, behaviors you might associate as being quite traditionally patriarchal and masculine during this time. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I see violence against women increased, more GBV, domestic violence, men refusing to wear masks. lack of self-care uh, by men, control of what women uh, are able and unable to do with their children and tasks at home, intimate partner violence, uh, sexual violence, increased GBV, 
uh, more willingness to control behaviors of members in the home, increased feminicides, domestic violence, child abuse, risk-taking behavior, alcohol abuse, violence against women in politics uh, due to shrinking political space, intimate partner violence, lack of access to regular in income, violence, depression, suicide, Yeah, risky behavior, uh, lack of representation and post-recovery task force, mansplaining, uh, three exclamation marks. Our colleague uh, was feeling strongly about that one. Use of language, which is militaristic, uh, taking on uh, the pandemic or waging war uh, against the pandemic as we're seeing in many contexts men believing that they are not vulnerable to COVID-19 uh, because of their race, religion, et cetera, uh, wearing of masks associated with weakness, early child uh, forced marriage, skirting domestic work uh, during the lockdown. I'm seeing a lot of uh, comments regarding the use of masks and lack of self-care as a uh, propeller for increased contagion, no? Uh, privileged men who have never been told no uh, before protesting restrictions. Generalized language on war and extreme security. Uh, unwanted pregnancies of women partners. <laughs> Wonderful, I'll just read a few more, but these are incredibly insightful and thank you. They set up quite nicely the conversation we will be embarking on jointly today. Uh, lack of shared childcare and household responsibilities. Disregard, minimization of the pandemic, insensible jokes using the, plan, uh, the pandemic to play politics and to hold on to power. Uh, increase in financial scams directed towards women. I'll just read one more. Men are harming self and others. And of course, one more, pardon me, very important, shrinking space uh, for women's civil society organizations. Great, there's so many more. Uh, and I have almost 91, more messages. I, I think this topic uh, is sparking uh, quite a lot of response for participants as we're seeing, uh, right? The exhibition of these uh, masculine behaviors from the individual to the structural political level and the cascading effects that that has, uh, of course, upon gender justice, upon women, girls, and LGBTQ communities. Uh, and so I think uh, that really sets up nicely what a, an important conversation we're about to embark on. Um, having said that, uh, I passed on uh, the, the microphone to uh, Bafana Kumalo, who's our uh, co-Men Engage Alliance co-chair, uh, also part of Men Engage Africa and Sanke Gender Justice Bafana, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, and I pass the word to you so you can begin uh, the conversation with our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning, uh, good evening to the colleagues on this webinar. We're glad to have you uh, on this important platform. Uh, this discussing this important uh, topic, which is of interest to all of us. Uh, I thought I will lay the basis first why we thought it wise to organize this workshop. Um, as we all know, before COVID-19, domestic violence was already a global emergency. Uh, in many of our countries, um, the incidences of violence against women were high already. Um, and, and an urgent problem 
made worse during COVID-19, of course, as we see cases of violence against women that are shooting through the roof in many of our countries. <clears throat> in France, uh, we're getting information that uh, at the moment there's about 30 percent increase of domestic violence. In Argentina, it's 25 percent. In Cyprus, 30 percent. And in Singapore, 33 percent. And I'm sure if we were to collect data from other countries, we would more or less see similar figures that are astonishing. The issue is further amplified based on the intersection, of course, the intersecting forms of oppression <coughs> that uh, becomes prevalent in times of crisis like this. Um, I was sharing with colleagues earlier that we are also beginning to see violent episodes on the basis of race. Um, we are seeing a lot of black people being attacked in China, uh, some being blamed for COVID-19. On the contrary, we see in the US, people of Chinese origin being blamed for uh, COVID-19 and, and the politics being used basically to play football around such an important uh, pandemic that is affecting all of us. And so we felt it's important that <clears throat> we have this platform where we have the conversation as people that are in the sector working on issues of gender transformation, working on women's rights, working on human rights, we do need to have this conversation so that we look at what are the mitigating factors that we can bring to bear on these issues. We also see, I mean, we zoomed in on masculinities uh, precisely because we want to know how does it relate to violence at all, at all levels. Where there is violence invariably, whether it's uh, internal conflict in countries, whether it's military, uh, whether it's uh, violence in the homes, there seems to be this nexus around masculinities how masculinities uh, are described and defined and how they play themselves out in communities. And we want to interrogate this. Why is this the case? Why is this increase uh, so prevalent, particularly during COVID-19? And how do we respond? And where possible, how do we prevent violence? Uh, in many of our countries, we're experiencing lockdowns where people are contained, are supposed to be contained in homes. And the bigger question that people, women are asking particularly, how do they continue to survive in an environment where they are supposed to be contained with people that are, they are perpetrators of violence uh, in the home, in a space that is confined and where there can be very little help to mitigate against this. What do we do as people who are working in this sector to improve the work we do with men and boys. Because if we are to disrupt um, these toxic masculinities, these dangerous masculinities, we need to work with men and boys in order to change the narrative about what it means to be a boy, what it means to be a man, and how we need to relate to women, how we need to relate to people of different uh, or alternative sexual orientation. And in this context, we also want to get back to the bigger question around accountability. Because as men engage, we believe the principle of accountability to women's and the LGBTI community is very, very important, cannot be uh, reduced, and it has to be enhanced, particularly at moments like this, so that our commitment and our conviction must be seen to be in the forefront of our response to the challenges that we are facing at the moment. Well, colleagues, you are not here to listen to me. Uh, we have eminent uh, speakers uh, that will be uh, having a conversation with us. We have arranged this webinar not in a lecture form because we thought it's important that we make it much more important, interactive, and we would like to encourage you 
that as we continue with the conversation, please feel free to also raise your questions on the chat box and colleagues are collecting those and we will be giving them to the speakers to respond. Or if you have suggestions that you would like to make as we are engaging in the conversation, please, please feel free to do that. Our two speakers, which I will introduce quickly, uh, we have Lisa Davis from Madre, a feminist organization. Um, Lisa has a vast experience of working in the area uh, of uh, feminism and women's development and in the areas of uh, uh, violence uh, against women. And she will share with us in this uh, webinar uh, on the work that she is doing in her organization and how they are responding to these issues that I've laid out in the introductory section. We also have our colleague, Carlos Idibu, who is from NAMEN, uh, our MEM Engage partner, um, uh, who will also be talking from the LGBTQ uh, perspective. Um, what are the issues that are affecting uh, the LGBT community during um, uh, COVID-19. COVID-19, in a sense, is eliciting a lot of issues that were percolating, some under the carpet, but bringing them to the fore and confronting all of us. And it's, it's amazing how even bigotry um, is rearing its head even during a, a difficult moment like this when as human beings, we should be in solidarity with one another, holding each other's hand and confronting the challenge that is posed on us by COVID-19, uh, you still see um, residues of, 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 of discrimination, um, of separation. And it is due to this that our two speakers will be addressing us um, this, this, this afternoon and this morning. So Lisa, uh, let me start with you. Um, it might be useful that at this point you uh, put on your, um, your, your video so that people can see you. My, my first question to you, Lisa, is uh, Madre started a coalition of uh, feminist organizations, uh, which includes Men Engage Alliance. Uh, can you please share with us about this coalition and what it has been working uh, uh, on this uh, as pa in partnership during the COVID-19 crisis. Lisa? Sure, thank you, uh, Bafana, I appreciate that. And thanks to uh, Men Engage for organizing this, this webinar. It's great to have a space to be able to talk about these pressing issues. So um, yeah, Madre, uh, we came together with Men Engage and with other uh, like-minded allies in the movement uh, to work on the issue of domestic violence that we know is uh, ensuing on the, on the coattails of the, the COVID virus. So we pulled together a coalition of like-minded organizations who are working on this issue. Uh, Media Matters for Women, which is an organization that really works on providing mechanical technical assistance for uh, local organizations who want to work on messaging through uh, different formats like Bluetooth or um, through uh, WhatsApp groups. And with Nobel Women's Initiative, because the issue of domestic violence is very important to Nobel Women's laureates, which is, is good to know. Um, <clears throat> and WILF, which is a women's organization that works in conflict. So these three women's organizations, you know, we were all working together and we realized that, you know, domestic violence is such a broader issue. It, it's not just about intimate partner violence um, or, or a woman's issue, it's a men's issue. It's uh, an issue about disability. It, uh, it's an issue about LGBT status. So knowing this, we realized that we needed a stronger and broader coalition. And that's why all of us came together with Men Engage, with uh, Women Enabled, a, a disability rights organization, and with Outright Action International, an international LGBTI organization. And together we developed a briefing paper and we're also working on a toolkit uh, to provide 
uh, practical, concrete recommendations for activities that local organizations and countries around the world can engage in to help reduce the spread of COVID and also work on prevention of domestic violence uh, within that work that they do. So I hope that answers Thank your you, question. Thank you, Mr. So, yes, yes, thank you very much. I'm sorry I've been having challenges with my connectivity here. I've, I've been missing some stuff, but um, I've, I've got a, a, a good grasp of um, the essence of what we are saying. And, and it, it's important, and I'm sure colleagues will come back to you about some of the things that uh, you have shared. Um, if we can move to the second question, you referred to the briefing paper that you have developed and the toolkit that you are working on, which we believe will be a great resource for, for this work. Can you tell us more about them and also when and where can we find them? Already colleagues have indicated they are looking for resources, so just, just share more. No, that's, that's great to hear. We um, are just finishing up the, the toolkit now, uh, the English version, and then we plan to get it translated into about you know five languages i think arabic uh, kurdish spanish french um, and of course we'll, we'll already have it in english and then we'll also have a, a word version uh, for people with disabilities who need a version that way and where, where pdf just doesn't work um, so we're hoping to have the english version finalized this week and then um, you know, by the end of the month, have it translated into uh, multiple languages. But let me tell you the more exciting part, which is what's in the toolkit. So what we've done is we've developed the toolkit to be in three parts. Uh, preventing, addressing, and documenting domestic violence. So this includes very practical types of activities that groups can do, in, including men's groups. Uh, for preventing, it's really about messaging. So how do we work on domestic violence prevention while still keeping safe from COVID? And so that's what we attempted to do, was really talk about the kinds of messages one can put out. We include information for groups who might run radio or television. And in those cases, we have pop quizzes that you can have, you know, you can, you can articulate to your audience. Uh, we have scripts that people can read for public service announcements. We also have examples of tweets and memes and um, other types of social media messaging that folks can do. And we also include not only domestic violence, but COVID prevention messaging too, and, and ways that we can combine both messaging, because this helps reduce duplicative efforts to reach out to uh, folks who might be vulnerable to these issues and is an easier way to reach people on these issues because it can be very stigmatizing to talk about domestic violence by itself. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, how you deal with your frustration when you're at home or in social isolation uh, and you include that in the COVID context, which is where that really comes up, then it's, we find that it's been much more receptive for, um, for people to be able to really to really hear those messages. So right now the toolkit's like, you know, it's a lot, it's big, it has lots of examples. And um, as soon as it's done, we wanna make it available to everyone. We'll post it on our website and hopefully all the coalition members will post it on their websites. And then the next step would be to do another webinar. And hopefully Men Engage will wanna do one and invite people back and we can, you know, go through the, the toolkit step by step and talk about, you know, and answer questions on, on how some of these activities can do, uh, we can do these activities. So that's the plan. Thank, thank you, Lisa. That, that sounds very exciting uh, and, and, and very interesting. I mean, I like the fact that uh, this tool is developed with uh, different languages, which means more people can engage with them. Uh, but it's also providing, you know, something tangible for people to can respond to the challenges that they are facing and the fact that you have integrated not just about domestic violence but how do you respond to COVID and how the two interlink i, I think it's a brilliant idea and uh, it's useful uh, i'm sure we'll all appreciate that 
But Lisa, why do you think it's important to look at domestic violence uh, issues in the middle of a pandemic? I thought everyone now would all be focusing on, you know, how do we flatten the curve? How do we ensure that we deal with the virus, which is confronting all of us, almost in a singular uh, focus uh, as it were? Why is domestic violence so stubborn as it were that even in this period, it keeps rearing its head? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. I mean, research shows us that domestic violence always goes up when there's crisis or conflict or disaster of any sort. So it really doesn't matter if it's conflict in the Congo or a hurricane in New Orleans. Uh, we see it go up, you know, across the, the globe wherever crisis might happen. And it's, you know, really uh, makes sense in terms of that domestic violence would also be going up in the COVID context. I mean, we have 90 countries in lockdown. We have about 4 billion people who are sheltering at home from the COVID-19 pandemic. And this has turned into domestic violence becoming an epidemic within an epidemic. So a lot of countries have been responding to this. They're, they're calling attention to this issue. In fact, Guterres, the UN Secretary General, called for a global ceasefire on domestic violence and asked countries to really focus on this issue because we know as the virus spreads, so does the issue of social isolation and frustration and you know, deprivation of resources and other kinds of crises that are always hand in hand with the increase of domestic violence. So right now it's a really important issue for us to be working on. And it's really an important issue that has to be addressed at the local level, because really only a bottom-up approach with grassroots groups taking the lead in the work that they do is, is really gonna solve this issue. Thanks, thanks, Lisa. In fact, uh, the executive director of U, U, UN Women, uh, Ms. Pumzile Nguka, describes this as a shadow pandemic. Um, in a sense, it's a shadow, but it's a very transparent shadow because we all see uh, dominance um, all over the country um, and in all the countries of the world. You know, it, it is a major problem. Um, shall we move on then, uh, Lisa? Um, for organizations like ourselves, Men Engage, and the many organizations that are working with men and boys, how do we strengthen? the element of accountability in working with feminist organizations like yours um, during periods like this, so that you know, we strengthen the cooperation and the relationship, and that there's a sense of um, you know, mutuality in approach and, and, and acknowledgement of the, the, the tremendous work that the feminist movement has done over years on some of these issues. Well, uh, and the truth is, we can't do this without male allies. This is uh, only an issue that we can address if we all work together in coalition. And, and it's important, you know, for all of us to remember that because we're all fighting for the same thing, which is sustainable peace and harmony within our communities. And that only happens if we can address domestic violence. And we can only address domestic violence if we're working together. So there's a huge role that men's groups can play in this uh, in terms of not only in messaging, but also in outreach to other men in the community um, about these issues and about ways of channeling frustrations by other means, by talking about and disseminating a more feminist and equality perspective. Um, and a lot of that we also include in our toolkit because we know that's a big part of addressing domestic violence. So, for example, uh, communities really listen to social leaders. They listen to the social influencers that are local uh, that people look up to or, or look at as elders or, you know, look at, you know, as someone they admire. And getting them to engage in these messages, getting um, our social leaders to engage in messaging out in the community about uh, different ways to channel frustration or to um, you know, help around the house if you're in social lockdown or to find ways to engage um, that's constructive. 
those kinds of messages coming from the right people can really make a difference for all community members because it really is something that takes all of us working together to, to put an end to domestic violence. Yeah, I wish we could talk more, Lisa, but uh, I'm worried time is, is our enemy as, as usual. Uh, my, my last question to you, uh, you talked about how domestic violence is riding on the coattails of the virus. Um, uh, is there a way that uh, this campaign can also help address the rise in authoritarianism and the rollback of fundamental rights, which is increasing during a pandemic? I mean, in most of our countries, we see the military or the police, civil liberta liberties being undermined you know, basically becoming law unto themselves, uh, executing people who are not uh, on lockdown and all of that. So uh, what would you suggest uh, would need to be done to deal with these fundamental uh, rights that are uh, being undermined uh, during this period? Yeah, I, that is a really great question. I mean, we know that the anti-gender movement and uh, the rise in authoritarianism is capitalizing on the chaos that the virus brings. And they're using this as an opportunity to curtail rights. And when you curtail gender rights, uh, you really are curtailing rights for everyone because civic rights and uh, other types of civil rights uh, really fall right behind gender rights. So we know that authoritarianism uses crisis as an opportunity to pick on those who are most vulnerable to begin with, and then they just oppress everybody uh, in their path. So one thing that uh, authoritarianism does is it says that domestic violence isn't real. It's not a human rights violation. They say that domestic violence is a family issue. It's a private issue. And they do that because they want to take away the power of coalitions working together, the, the power in acknowledging that domestic violence is really an epidemic. And part of the way that they do this is by, you know, giving domestic violence this very narrow definition. And sometimes we do that generally too. We look at domestic violence and we say, well, that's intimate partner violence, isn't it? Well, intimate partner violence is certainly included in domestic violence, but by definition, domestic violence is household violence, which is so much more. So household violence also includes, for example, uh, LGBT people who are trapped at home with homophobic or transphobic family members. It includes people with disabilities who might be being abused uh, at home or have lack of access to services that they need because of social isolation. And we know that there's this broader set of domestic violence against women that's also skyrocketing under COVID. So for example, femicides, corrective rape, honor killings, earlier forced marriage. These are all forms of domestic violence that have just been given other names. But what we should be doing in our work is expanding our work on ending domestic violence to include all these forms of domestic violence. So intimate partner violence for sure, but also honor killings and early marriage and, and femicides and uh, discrimination against people with disabilities. And if we look at all of this type of household violence together, it's one way that we can start to build solidarity across other organizing lines. It's a way to address a larger set of violence that happens. And by recognizing all this as domestic violence, we start to counter this narrative put out by authoritarian and fundamentalist regimes who look to downplay the problem of domestic violence. Yeah, we, we have our work cut out for us, Lisa, as if, you know, challenges of uh, women's discrimination and violence is not enough. Yeah. We still have, uh, you know, these superstructures that are undermining uh, these rights uh, at every turn, and uh, we really need to remain vigilant. It's interesting to me, this morning as I woke up, someone was trolling me. Is that trolling? Is that the term they use here uh, on, on Twitter? Um, who comes from an organization that calls itself Men's Rights? Uh, I think when they saw the advert for this webinar, 
uh, he then started saying, yeah, but what about the men who are abused at home and all of that? And it, it, it fascinated me that you still have people who are, you know, this mode that it's almost uh, an us against them mentality. So, you know, if you talk about violence against women, you must equate that to men's violence. I mean, violence against men at the home. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in our country, for instance, we struggle with this because we don't have evidence of this. We know that there will be cases uh, isolated, uh, but uh, you know, I'm always fascinated why would men want to almost juxtapose this conversation uh, when you raise the issue of GBV. Um, and and I, I found it quite uh, strange that uh, we, we, we have to be confronted by this simply because we are raising an issue that is affecting a sizable number of women across the world, you know, and people want to almost rationalize and divert and, you know, make it uh, as if it's not as serious as it is. So it's important that we have this conversation and colleagues have been making inputs on the chat box. And um, it would be important that uh, obviously after we listen to our colleague Carlos, we obviously allow uh, the colleagues to engage uh, with both of you. Thank you very much, Lisa, uh, for all your inputs. And uh, in this short moment, we've learned a lot on the important work that you are doing and you have raised fundamental questions that we need to uh, take to heart as we engage uh, with the challenges of COVID-19. Shall we then move on to Carlos? Um, if you can show your, yourself, Carlos. I'm here. <laughs> yes, uh, Carlos, how gendered are power dynamics playing themselves out in the lives of the LGBTQ during this pandemic? And what kinds of violence have you noticed increasing during this period? Yeah, um, thank you, Rafana. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, and thank you, Lisa, too, because I was listening to, um, to, to you speak to your presentation, and it's quite interesting to see, like, uh, how the, um, a lot of things have been done um, at the UN level, but also um, according to the reality on ground. And uh, to build up on that, for instance, um, it's very, it's very good, you know, to see during this pandemic the kind of trajectory that all the issues that have been uh, the LGBT communities have been facing, you know, for decades or even centuries because of the uh, the sexual orientation and gender identity um, are just being worsening um, at many level. And um, in in the um, as part of the work that the uh, the LGBT communities are doing, so there is um, the, this coalition that we call the uh, the ERC, which is a equal rights coalition. It's the uh, intergovernmental you know coalition to bring together uh, government uh, that have a strong you know statement to support LGBT human rights. And um, as part of this, uh, uh, this organization, the Equal Right Coalition, so there is the civil society uh, organization, obviously LGBT civil society organization that um, um, have a look on the work, the kind of work that different governments as part of the Equal Right Coalition are doing uh, to support LGBT human rights in the, in the world. So um, there is, in the Equal Right Coalition, there is uh, 43, uh, government that are members and um, they're surrounded by a lot of LGBT civil society organization. So in this crisis, the civil society organization put together um, a statement um, relating uh, some of the, uh, the specific issues that the pandemic has been, you know, raising. And the U.S. is a member of the uh, Equal Rights Coalition. Actually, they've been one of the, uh, the first countries when um, we started working on putting together the Equal Rights Coalition. The, uh, the United States were one of the first countries to sign, you know, to become member of the Equal Rights Coalition. But in this crisis, 
um, the State Department refused for the first time to sign a statement coming from this, the LGBT equal, uh, civil society organization as part of the Equal Rights Coalition. And this is a huge, it's a huge back, uh, backlash that is uh, been affecting and it shows clearly how the, uh, the state is using the, the government, the current uh, United States government is using its power. And once again, um, related to like a patriarchy and to the, uh, the, the masculine, the men privilege, and along with the conservative, you know, uh, uh, power and, and, and strength to push back all the work that has been doing both at the uh, UN level and with, along with international organization and, uh, and, and grassroots organized, LGBT grassroots organization. It clearly shows that um, in the, uh, the next few years and the post COVID um, uh, 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 period, it will be another crisis because when it, uh, 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 a country like the state doesn't sign this strong statement reporting how COVID has been uh, impacting LGBT, you know, people, and how the the, the the community is mobilizing government to support LGBT right in this pandemic, and they're not signing it. It's a huge backlash. The other thing uh, is also a few days uh, ago we had the uh, International Day Against Homophobia, uh, Biphobia, and Transphobia. W once again, um, the uh, the states. Uh, the, uh, the statement that the, the UN core group <clears throat> based on the uh, uh, Idaho bit, the uh, International Day on Homophobia, uh, Biphobia and Transphobia submitted, uh, the State Department refused to sign that statement for the first time. So in this crisis, we're having two big, you know, issues coming from the, uh, the State Department, which is a big backlash against the LGBT, you know, uh, communities, uh, human rights. So when you look at those kind of things happening in a pandemic that is already, you know, causing mental health issues in, 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 in many directions, which are causing like a cut of funding, um, which is a, um, uh, preventing you know, um, vulnerable people to have access to medical, like especially people living with, H, uh, with HIV within the LGBT community and in countries where that was already difficult, like uh, the HIV medication was already difficult to have to access. And governments that hold, you know, this uh, uh, um, uh, ability to, to, to provide those needs to the LGBT communities are not doing it. And rather than doing it, the signing statement to clearly demonstrate that they are, they, they, they're not supporting LGBT, you know, human rights. This is a, a, a huge concern. It's a huge concern, not only for the LGBT community, but also, you know, I think for the, uh, for, for countries around the world, because um, the, the, uh, the position that the U.S. government have been taking in this pandemic, it's, a, it's, a, it's affecting many sectors in, in, in many people's lives. Like, uh, for instance, in the, in the United States, the Black African-American community is clearly the percentage of uh, people infected and dying from COVID. It's high, and that is related to many other factors that the government has never been able to, you know, to address. So, at the um, at the government level, this is what is happening. This is what happen is happening. So, the, the, the political cards that the, the government in developed countries are playing, you know, to reinforce or to worsen the situation of COVID in the global South countries, but specifically against you know vulnerable population, including L uh, LGBT folks, it's clearly showing. Yeah, thank you, Carlos. It's not a nice picture you're painting, but this is the reality we need to confront. How do we ensure that we don't get uh, the gains we have made so far rolled back because of you know the reemergence of these uh, masculinities at this at this time? Um, now, what would you say is the role of the police and the security forces during this period? Um, how are they responding to episodes of violence? Are they helpful? 
you know, uh, uh, is, do you think they are making a difference? Do they intervene as they should in terms of the regulations to ensure that they protect everybody? How do the LGBT community um, um, experience uh, the, the, the role that the police have? Well, the, um, the, um, um, the, the, the protectionism, you know, political agenda that each country is playing in this pandemic um, um, allows, you know, each government to come up with their own approach. So in some countries, the, uh, they're talking about social distancing. In other countries, they're talking about lockdown. In other countries, they're talking about curfews. And even when we, when we, when we, uh, we, we came in the context of uh, the lockdown, it's also differs from a country to another one, uh, depending on how the human rights, you know, agenda look like in, the, in, in those countries. So in most African countries, you know, uh, to uh, per se, countries where the government came up with a lockdown agenda, for instance, it's not just an agenda that comes with measure that uh, 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 populations or communities can, you know, better understand and, and respect because this is a new reality that nobody has been exposed to. Um, rather than doing that, rather than coming up with a clear communication agenda, you know, to inform, you know, communities. So they will put the police and the army on the streets to police and, you know, violence uh, uh, communities. So what is happening now is that um, uh, at the curfew time, for instance, uh, if I'm taking the, uh, the, uh, the case of Ivory Coast, which was like at, at 9 p.m. when they were still having the curfew. So the police and the army will be on the streets. Not only that, they will, you know, take advantage of people who are running late, you know, to go home uh, uh, and be at home before the curfew time, you know, uh, um, started. But also in this period of time, the, uh, the targeting specific areas where LGBT folks to use, you know, to do the sex work, you know, for instance. And some of the, some of the, the soldiers as part of the army who have been in those spaces because, you know, so saying that they are ensuring the security there. And so they know people from the LGBT community who are also sex workers. So they're coming up with like a, things like a checking their IDs. And when you see the trans woman, um, we don't have the gender, you know, marker, you know, rights. For, the, for trans people in, in, in Ivory Coast, as, 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 as well as in many African countries. So when in this pandemic, when you're coming, when a police uh, uh, as, uh, officer or in a soldier army come in, checking the ID and notice that, oh, your danger marker in your ID doesn't match with your appearance, therefore you're violating the law, and for that you, 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 have, be, you have to be arrested, it it's clearly shows how the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the government, once again, is not uh, giving the right information or right instructions to the police officers and the army to uh, uh, make sure that they're ensuring the safety you know, uh, on the street rather than taking advantage of you know, people and using the power to abuse the most vulnerable uh, populations, such as women and LGBT people. And we saw that also in, in, in the case of Uganda, where um, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the men's shelters, um, there, there was 23, you know, um, uh, um, queer men who, uh, homeless actually, who got arrested for not respecting the, um, the, um, uh, the, the time of the, um, uh, the curfew or the lockdown. Like, how could people who are already homeless and don't even, I'm not even sure that it will have access to the, uh, to, you know, to this uh, shelter in the night time and have safety in that shelter because of the sexual orientation are uh, being, you know, arrested, um, uh, uh, beaten up, and, and on top of that by the mayor of the city who is forcing them to show the face and, uh, and, and spread that uh, on, on, on YouTube and the social uh, and social media. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's showing, you know, once again, that it's not just during the war that the government is 
it's putting the army out there, you know, to violate the population uh, 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 um, uh, right, but also in, in, in this kind of crisis where a confusing crisis that where people don't understand anything and because they, they don't have, the, the, the government never have the mechanism to, you know, to inform the population in case of like a crisis happening. So people have to navigate through that by themselves and build up their own understanding of the whole, you know, uh, all the packages of instruction that is coming up. So the government itself is not understanding this the instruction that they're putting out there, uh, nor the population, but they're still putting some authorities out there who are just violating, you know, uh, uh, most vulnerable people uh, um, rights. So this is what's happening. And um, the, um, some of the uh, the car group at the UN, for in the case of the Uganda, have been, you know, uh, signing, you know, some action, um, some petition to, to denounce the arbitrary arrest, but how far that will affect, you know, the, politi uh, the political agenda in those countries where LGBT uh, folks human rights are being strongly violating in, in this, in this uh, pandemic? That's a big question. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one, uh, um, Carlos. Uh, and obviously, you know, one of the major issues around this time is that we must be able to collect information uh, as reliable as possible so that it helps us to respond adequately to the challenges. Now, there is a, there's a, 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 a information gap, as it were, data gap, uh, because um, how do LGBT people uh, re report when they are mm -hmm. violated in a country where they are not recognized? So how do you think we can address this challenge? Because I think it's important that we get a sense of the extent of the problem so that it informs our programming as, as we seek to uh, ameliorate the, the, the challenge that people are facing. And, mm -hmm. and what, what, what would you suggest is the way to try and close this data gap mm -hmm. so that we get reliable information you know, for in, interventions and, and responses? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I think, um, and, and I say that many times, uh, I don't want to sound redundant, but it, um, uh, and Lisa also mentioned in terms of allyship, um, you know, it's um, it's good to see like uh, uh, an organization like the Global, you know, Men Engage Alliance to stand as a strong, you know, ally for the LGBT community. And I will be sharing, you know, um, um, some some report from the um, uh, the Commonwealth uh, Equal Rights Coalition, which is part of the uh, the Commonwealth. It's a uh, uh, 42 countries um, um, that has been under the uh, the anti sodomy law coming from the British colonial, you know, uh, law. And uh, so the, the report came out. Um, the, what I mentioned about the, the, the Equal Right Coalition also statement, as well as the Hida Hobbit, you know, uh, statement. So those are the kind of things that um, an organization like the Global Men Engage, uh, you know, should be aware of, you know, um, and, and also sign and stand, strongly stand as a lie. To come back on uh, on your question around uh, around data, um, the, uh, the 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 respect the research aspect of the work that uh, LGBT organizations, including international organizations, have been doing before any you know pandemic or crisis, uh, it's been one of the strong you know way to collect data and to, um, to, to have evidence-based evidence you know, uh, approaches to better um, understand the kind of work and how, what, how the issues could be addressed. Because the pandemic has been happening so fast and things are going so fast, so um, right now there is only a few you know, international organizations that uh, were able to provide report uh, based on the data that have, they've been collecting in terms of like uh, assessing, you know, uh, LGBT folks needs uh, to better understand the specific, you know, areas of like uh, that the, the, the crisis just uh, uh, worsen. So, for instance, there was a report of the um, the Human Rights, you know, Action International, which is an organization uh, based in in in, in the um, in, in New York that is doing some work with uh, countries around the world, including 
African countries. There is also the report that the, uh, the Commonwealth Equal Rights Coalition uh, um, uh, um, network, you know, just sent out. Uh, and, uh, and as per yesterday, we received the, uh, the report of the, um, the ILGA Europe and East Asia. So those, all those reports, you know, uh, are coming up with specific realities that the LGBT communities are facing, you know, in the home country, because it's very hard now for like a grassroots organization in different countries to do those need assessments because offices are closed. Um, uh, there is internet, you know, issues. Uh, people cannot really work. You know, they cannot reach out to um, uh, the organization members, uh, just even to check about them. It's very difficult. It's only recently that things like that have been done. So those reports, I think they, we, we need a better, you know, coordination. Um, uh, the, the international organization that uh, were able to do those, you know, uh, research and community consultation needed to coordinate themselves and look at what are the similarities in those, you know, in, in those outcomes and what are the, uh, the, the key areas that they need, you know, to focus on. For instance, the mental health issues has been, you know, has been one of the major issues that the community came, came up with. Uh, uh, funding, cutting funding. Uh, a lot of organizations have been losing, you know, the funding. Um, uh, they don't know how, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, they will be able to, to, to continue working and implementing the program and services for the, uh, the, the organization. The, um, the, 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 the lockdown also uh, is showing, you know, more violences in terms of like, uh, um, LGBT folks not having a safe space when they have to stay home, but worse, it's it's bringing up again the uh, the whole conversation around conversion therapy. I heard stories where some lesbian has been forced by the parents, you know, to sending them in a village and getting married. But not only that, but they are applying, you know. Uh, uh, cultural and traditional convention therapy practices on them so they can, you know, uh, stop, prevent them to keep be, uh, being, you know, queer or lesbian or, or gay, gay people. So all those things are happening in countries that are signed, you know, for many years, the human right, the universal human rights chart, but none of those, you know, right are being respected, you know, rather than that, it's, it's just being worsening. So in terms of practical, you know, um, uh, actions, number one, you know, we need more, you know, data to better understand, you know, the, the broad picture. A second, we need a support from, we need more allies, you know, uh, to stand and not only sign, you know, the petition, that are being put out there, but also use those data, you know, to, um, to improve uh, not only the understanding, but also how, what kind of mechanism they can, you know, they can work on to support LGBT uh, uh, organizations, both, you know, at the UN, but also grassroots organization. Third, um, how can we um, work on Looking at with other organizations like a, a, a heterosexual, let me put it that way, heterosexual organizations, the kind of work that they're doing, the mechanism that they have been, you know, developing over years, the best practice that they have been using to address issues around, you know, uh, patriarchy, toxic masculinity, and all the conversation around masculinities, how those can be, you know, uh, used and compared to the reality that the LGBT folks are, are living, are, going, are, are, are experiencing in terms of like a toxic masculinity and feminism and the whole conversation around that and take out of that the best approach, you know, to, 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 to implement, you know, uh, 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 project or programs uh, in terms of edu uh, educating, you know, folks around boys and men and uh, uh, realities and also the feminism and uh, toxic masculinity. Fourth point is really, in terms of like um, understanding the uh, the um, the picture of how funding uh, look like uh, in for many LGBT organizations, starting by LGBT organizations that are already involved in the global men engage uh, uh, work in different regions. So those are like a few you know 
kind of a recommendation that I um, that I um, that will come up with. Uh, obviously, there is a lot because this pandemic it's not ending yet, and as we're moving on, we're moving forward. There are more, you know, issues building up, and and I think we need to. Um, and I hope hopefully we'll get more data as to be able to better respond to those needs in the uh, in the next future. Thank you very much, Carlos. Um, um, my colleagues uh, Jenny and Magali have been listening uh, throughout the session and also uh, checking the, the chat box uh, if there are questions. I will now hand over to them um, if they would like uh, to raise questions both to Lisa and to Carlos. I'm aware that uh, some of the questions may have been answered in the course of the conversation by both speakers, but if there are key questions that uh, they want to place on uh, this platform, please, Magali, Jenny. Thank you so much. And uh, maybe just to encourage everyone, again, if you have a, a particular question, if you want to type it now in the chat box, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, Bakana, thank you to everyone for your comments, uh, really insightful contributions. Uh, there were a, for a few questions, and uh, Lisa, thank you for answering them, but uh, maybe we uh, can raise them again to address them more centrally. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, many partners have been asking what measures can we take to consolidate international solidarity to pressure governments to address uh, violence uh, during this time uh, what can we do to support them or what can we do in general no um, as well uh, there was a question in terms of uh, some male politicians uh, have been seen as heroes uh, for how they're handling the crises uh, of course, despite mistakes, where as other leaders, in this case, uh, uh, white lesbian left-wing politicians have had to step back uh, due to massive critique. Uh, so I think connected to that uh, question as well, uh, how can we uh, perhaps uh, raise these issues no, on our male leadership uh, and how they are responding and also being heroized, uh, heroic, made heroic at this time, no? There was also a question of how can we set up uh, the security sector to be gender responsive uh, and small arms control can respond to domestic violence as well. I saw that you addressed that too, but if you would like to share anything else uh, in terms of those points, I'll stop there. Uh, and part in one more question, would love to hear about how organizations are engaging men to ad address patriarchal norms that cause issues such as GBV, uh, especially during the pandemic. Uh, any resources for LGBTQI mm -hmm. community addressing stigma and violence in developing countries? Uh, mm -hmm. Carla, maybe you can point us to some resources. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Should I respond to that? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, there are there are resources, and um, and I'm glad that, like, for instance, uh, some of the work that um, uh, Jennifer has been doing is like a mapping in this pandemic, like a resources and sharing that um i'm not sure how far those resources go um within you know the uh, the membership but um yeah this work has been has been done and i'm also collecting um as soon as the report comes out you know i make sure that i uh, i send them to 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 jennifer um so she can still you know uh, keeping the uh, the membership informed about that there are other resources also let me just uh, double check the. Um, uh, yeah, the the uh, the uh, many other resources, you know, to to reinforce or improve the understanding of the LGBT realities, and and we're doing the work with the Global Men Engage, and those um, resources will be shared. So yeah, 
keep to end, then we'll keep you informed about that. Thank you so much. And one question in Spanish, and maybe then uh, hand over to Lisa. Uh, um, yeah, colleagues are wondering uh, if there's actually any uh, responses at government level that have actually been supporting uh, favorably, no, the LGBTQIA uh, plus community. So things that we can look at as a promising practice. Um, well, I can certainly address uh, some of the questions that were asked uh, in terms of uh, what measures we can do to increase international solidarity or work towards international solidarity. Um, we have recommendations in the briefing paper uh, and that link went out over the, the chat box uh, and those recommendations uh, were developed by the coalition for um, the international community, specifically for governments. And they're really recommendations that focus on things that governments can do um, that would really help address this issue. For example, the idea of combining COVID prevention messaging with domestic violence prevention messaging. It's very simple uh, thing that governments can support doing in humanitarian aid areas, you know, funding local groups to do. Uh, they're just not doing it because they haven't thought of it. So we need to get that message out there. Also, the idea of just um, having government support local organizations that are, you know, working on this issue, that are working on um, tailoring supportive services to vulnerable persons like people with disabilities, like the LGBT IQ population. Um, you know, also looking at um, making sure that we are monitoring and playing a watchdog role to make sure that governments are giving equal distribution of resources and aid for COVID prevention uh, to marginalized communities. Uh, because we know marginalized communities often are the ones that are left out and don't receive the resources for both COVID prevention and domestic violence prevention. And then I think uh, there's a few more, but the last one I'll just say is, uh, you know, really leaning on governments to recognize all forms of domestic violence, not mm -hmm. just intimate partner violence, but certainly including intimate partner violence. And this really means looking at how domestic violence, you know, especially because of the social isolation and the, and the lockdown issues from COVID affects LGBTIQ people, affects people with disabilities, uh, and also affects, you know, a broader swath of crimes that are committed against women that we often don't think of as domestic violence, but we really should be. And this is our moment to do something about all of those other crimes that do happen to other people and other forms of crimes that happen to women. So those are some of the recommendations that we make that we think if we're all calling on the international community to do, um, that we could start to, to chip away and, and make a difference on this issue. And then just quickly on the issue of um, LGBTIQ resources, uh, an organization called Outright Action International just put out a report. Carlos, Carlos knows what I'm talking about. Um, they just put out a report looking at um, the, uh, the effects of, the, of, of COVID on the LGBTIQ community. And that report takes a broad approach of looking at everything from good responses by governments to government crackdowns to you know, the, the issue of, of social isolation. So I would encourage everyone to check out that report. It's Outright Action International. And then lastly, on the issue of security sector and small arms, uh, the organization WILF, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, WILPF, and I can put that in the chat box, they've come out with some really strong um, commentary on looking at the gender issues and COVID prevention in the small arms context. So I would encourage folks to, to look at their, their website as well. Thank you so much.
Marali, any question in French? <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Um, no, no, nothing, no. nothing from French uh, at this point. There were only a, a few in Spanish, as you, as you already saw, and some comments, not only questions. Wonderful. And maybe we have a few more minutes, and I see some more questions coming in. Maybe we can uh, quickly address them. Uh, what is the role of religious, uh, the religious community? Uh, during COVID-19 and interrelation with domestic violence. Also a request uh, for Lisa, if you could talk a bit more about your phrase use, the anti-gender agenda. Um, and how do we prioritize domestic violence as an issue in our community during COVID-19 uh, and prepare men to address that uh, when there are issues of hunger, livelihood, and poverty? Also an open request for uh, how do we engage men and boys in these topics, no? I'll leave it there uh, and open it up to both of you uh, for the last few minutes of our Q&A. Mm -hmm. I, I think I would just jump in. <laughs> um, from the um, religious point, uh, point of view, yes, I mean, it's, it's been another big issue in the juris during this pandemic. We all know that the, um, the, uh, the religious fundamentalists, you know, who were already intoxicating um, a lot of government in many, you know, um, African countries, but also in, in other countries. And the government in those countries were supporting, you know, the, uh, those uh, fundamentalist religious actions in the country because they said it would, that's the one of the approaches that we're using to, um, for for instance, in, in the uh, the conversion therapy, you know, approach that is something that I was using in this pandemic. What's happening? Um, the religious people in some countries are also pushing, you know, uh, the population um, for and supporting the population to accuse LGBT people for being responsible of this pandemic. In, in the way that if it's something, it's this pandemic is happening and nobody's really understand, you know, how to address it. It's because some people like LGBT people have been having immoral, you know, uh, 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 um, um, uh, sexualities. Um, and obviously the populations are using that against, you know, uh, LGBT folks as well. And we, that also one of the causes of violence is within families and also in, in, in neighborhoods. So it's a reality that is happening. Um, what government are doing? Once again, nothing, because the government itself has never, has never faced this kind of uh, issues before. And that's what actually is worse in responding to this, you know, to this pandemic, because it seems like uh, when the government um, has an agenda, it's just to reinforce you know, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the own patriarch, patriarchal or the own interest agenda, rather than responding, as Lisa said, to, you know, the whole population, you know, uh, um, needs of human rights. Uh, in countries where they never had a, uh, an agenda, like uh, basically in, in the global south, so the agenda that the, the government is putting out there, it's just in case of L, in the cases of LGBT people and vulnerable population, it's just to worsen again, you know, the uh, the uh, the situation that those populations have already been in before. So it doesn't give a safe space. It doesn't give a space to 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 people to better navigate, you know, through that. And yeah, it's um, it's what's it's uh, that's role that the religions are playing in in, in the countries. So it's affecting different you know, corner different angles and sectors uh, at the social level, yeah. Um, well, I can follow that up on the question about uh, what I meant by talking about the anti-gender agenda. So this is a fast growing fundamentalist movement mm -hmm. um, of, and of, of right wing, radicals who are attacking, uh, you know, what we call gender rights, which would be, you know, women's rights, LGBTIQ rights, and, and you know, and how these issues affect men. 
Um, so um, they uh, tout this idea that something called gender ideology, which mm -hmm. is their term. Um, yeah. I, of, it's their term for when progressive people work on women's rights or LGBTIQ rights. They say it's called gender ideology and it has a lot of very warped ideas about how gender is not a real term. And they say that gender and sex mean the same thing and that gender is not a real idea. But we all know gender is a real idea. We know gender is a social construct, meaning that it's, uh, it's a it's a it's a category that is sometimes used, often used to create oppressive roles for uh, gender minorities. So you know the idea that women aren't allowed to work jobs or that LGBTI people aren't allowed to exist um, comes from the anti-gender movement, as mm -hmm. it's been it's been now coined. And they work very heavily in the international community and very heavily on local level. And often what we see linkages is between the anti-gender movement and right-wing authoritarianism and the rise of authoritarianism being fueled and supported even greatly financially by the anti-gender movement. So that's what it is. Um, will there be interest in further about understanding? Yeah, I mean, I just, I'm just jumping in because I, I just saw a question, you know, pop in about the, uh, the anti-gender ideologies. Um, I received a fact sheet a few days ago because I was myself, when I heard about that, I was trying, you know, to understand. I was like, uh, oh, we already, already have the, uh, the fundamentalists. Like, uh, what is this anti-gender ideologies, you know, coming? So I received a fact sheet, you know, a few days ago. Um, I need to check in my thousand files where I save it and then share that with Jenny because I think it's very important that it should be part of the, uh, the mapping that Jenny is doing um, because as Lisa, Lisa said, it's explaining you know, the, uh, the, the different component and angle that the intergender ideologists, it's, it's, it's a... Um, it's um, uh, their work is based on like uh, the the really ideology of that in terms of like uh, how they dig in 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 gender and they come up with their own understanding and this is the agenda that they're using to uh, really intoxicate and that group has also played a very important role when I mentioned earlier. Um, about the, uh, the statement that a uh, civil society organization as part of the Equal Rights Coalition uh, came up with in this pandemic. So the anti-gender ideologies have been very, you know, supportive of the State Department for not signing that statement. So it means they have a power. They have a power. It's a, it's a people as part of this anti-gender, you know, ideologies group have a lot of money and they're playing the card of the, of the, the money. They know how to support the, uh, the, 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 the U.S., the current U.S. government to push back, you know, LGBT human rights. So I think those kind of things need to be known in the membership, you know, and it's a document that's it's a very important to cross, you know, to share across the, uh, the membership. So it's it's really up to i think i will leave it to the global <laughs> secretariat if they want to organize another webinar you know around that but i um you know for now i will say it's definitely something that you know the membership need to know um to better understand like uh you know the uh the, the how to say the counterproductive work that other group are doing in terms of like uh, educating people around gender diversity you know yeah yeah, and I would just add it's an important issue too in terms of men's work because the anti-gender movement goes after men, men who are feminist activists saying that their work is not what real men should be doing. Yeah. So, you know, they really have these very rigid understanding of what um, gender roles are and what women can and can't do and how LGBT can exist. And those same gender roles are also oppressed on men with a very narrow narrative of what men should be doing as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, 
What a riveting conversation. We were able to dive in quite deeply and in a nuanced way, although of course we acknowledge there's so much more to discuss and yet uh, it was an incredibly fruitful conversation. Um, thank you to everybody also for your incredibly active participation on the chat box. Uh, you shared so many incredible insights from your own context, how you're observing, uh, these issues manifesting. Um, and of course, thank you so much to Bafana for guiding us along in the conversation and to Lisa and Carlos for your expertise and incredible knowledge. Uh, we're just really appreciative of uh, the space to continue to converse no? as a collective of people seeking to uh, uh, solutions, promising practices, and also analysis of these issues so that uh, we may be able to work together in solidarity uh, to uh, improve no? what we see occurring in lieu of COVID-19. Uh, we just wanted to quickly, as we're wrapping up and acknowledging we're uh, two minutes over, uh, we just wanted to link all of you to uh, what Men Engage Alliance does uh, in terms of accountability, and we just note very quickly, accountability for Men Engage Alliance is a central pillar that permeates uh, all of the work that we do. It's an incredible, incredibly important component uh, of, uh, of how we see our contribution no? uh, to the field in terms of uh, really being able to uh, put forward um, uh, resources, uh, propel conversations, centralize accountability and all the work uh, that we do from uh, internally towards, uh, internally as an alliance towards externally and how we engage with uh, partners. Um, so we wanted to share these, uh, these resources. The next slide is the link. Uh, so uh, you'll be able to connect to them uh, and if you can go to the one before, uh, Tom, pardon. Uh, and there's two main uh, documents that we point you to, no? The accountability standards and guidelines. Uh, and these aspire uh, for accountable allyship and action when working with men and boys, uh, improve efforts for gender justice that include a men and masculinities approach, uh, practical suggestions and how to respond to issues and improve practices and set uh, codes of conduct. Uh, so the standards and guidelines are uh, quite a helpful articulation in that. Uh, but then, of course, uh, there's also some uh, necessity to integrate no? those learnings and the accountability training toolkit facilitates that. Uh, and, and really, it's the integration of accountability from within individuals to our organizations to how we articulate our work uh, with feminist partners, uh, LGBTQIA plus partners, uh, so it works from, uh, from initially us as members of Men Engage in our own inner work and transformation all the way out through how we articulate that uh, in the work towards uh, gender justice and, and our contribution to being uh, accountable allies to feminist and um, LGBTQ IA plus movements. Uh, so we really encourage you to check those out. Thank you, Tom. And if you could uh, continue to the last slide. And then, uh, yeah, just wanting to highlight, um, we already shared it several times in the chat box, but if you would like to click on this link, this is the uh, toolkit to be published soon that we addressed um, and alluded to during the conversation. Thank you, Tom. And then part of the conversation was uh, really honing in on our need to collect data uh, and evidence at this time so that we can really have evidence-based uh, recommendations and policy making. We just want to quickly highlight this incredible effort being uh, put forward by the articulated uh, collaboration of colleagues uh, in the feminist movement, LGBT movement, uh, where uh, at this time they are, they have launched a, a feminist COVID response website. And here you can share your own resources, data, inputs, uh, uh, so that we can begin to compile and have a foundational base uh, of data so that we can begin to make those articulated recommendations. 
uh, as a gender justice uh, movement more broadly. So we encourage you to do that as well. There's some uh, shared principles that have been delineated to ensure that we promote a feminist COVID-19 response at government level. So there's some really helpful resources in terms of that. And you can also search by uh, country and context. Uh, so if you're looking for data within your own context, uh, this is a phenomenal resource uh, for you to connect with. Well, thank you so much. As we're coming to a close, we just wanted to say, and I think this was really highlighted within so many of the comments and questions today, uh, we will be continuing uh, with another webinar soon, uh, taking on a more structural analysis as we continue to move from uh, the individual level in many ways and engaging men and boys uh, and preventing and eliminating uh, the rise of uh, of course, violence against women and girls, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, violence against children, LGBTQIA plus communities, uh, all the way towards an assessment of masculinities uh, and how those are playing into uh, this uh, rise in domestic violence that we're witnessing during COVID-19. And we will continue with a bit more of a, a structural discussion uh, going into an assessment of, of patriarchy, uh, how we're seeing patriarchal manifestations, and as we tapped into here, militaristic uh, responses, nationalistic responses, uh, lack of cooperation. Uh, so please look out for our invitation for that. And we thank you sincerely. It was an honor to share this space for conversation with you. A thank you to uh, all of our panelists and moderator, uh, and take good care. Be safe. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank <laughs> you.